Well, God is a God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. And if you're in need of one, then welcome to this a study of the book and the life of Joshua. Joshua and the children of Israel were given a second shot at the promised land, and they took it. And if you're in need of a second shot at God's promised land for you, then this is your story. Welcome to Glory Days. Before we begin the message, let's do what we do every week. Let's make our Glory Days declaration. The words will appear on the screen. Please fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope and say it like you mean it. You ready? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. And God's promises are true. His word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. They are, Lord. They're good days. Forgive us for when we overcomplain and when we forget how blessed we are. Even those who carry deep and heavy burdens find strength in you, Lord. You are a good God. Open our hearts to receive a word today from you. Forgive our speaker. His sins are so many. Help us to see Jesus, our Savior, our Joshua, and just him. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, I was very comfortably seated in the exit row of the airplane when a passenger in the aisle called my name. He was a tall, light-haired fellow about 50 years of age who appeared to be on a business trip. He introduced himself, and because of the chaos of boarding a flight, we really didn't have a chance to visit, but I gathered this much that he had heard me speak somewhere some years before and had found some encouragement in my books and would like to talk someday. I returned the greeting and settled in for the trip. About an hour later, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned and Turns out it was the same fellow who greeted me in the aisle. He was sitting behind me, and he did have something to tell me, and he had written a note on a napkin. And the note read as follows. Max, six summers ago, Lynn and I buried our 24-year-old daughter. This came about following a lake accident in two weeks on life support. We didn't see this coming. How do you go on a summer vacation with four and come back home with three? Friends, some of whom had also buried precious children, rallied around our family. A country lawyer with his encouraging message that God means you good and not harm was one of those encouraging voices. Various copies of your books were given to Lynn and me, and we prayed for a miracle. I wanted her made new, her smile and brilliance restored. To unplug our daughter from life support was very, very hard. Although the decision was painful, we were confident that we were doing the right thing in laying her in the arms of a mighty God who knew our pain. His best work may not have been restoring Aaron to this life, but his assistance for Lynn and me to let him have her. He made our daughter better than new. He restored my Aaron to his eternal presence. This is his best work, and this was not a lightweight hope. This was an assurance. Let me have your daughter. I've got her now. God's children, reflecting the very nature of God, became his presence around us. Our faith is getting us through this. Faith is a choice. I read and reread that napkin many times, and I began to wonder how, how does this happen? Not the accident but the faith. Especially poignant question to ask on Father's Day weekend. How does a dad place his daughter in heaven's arms, believing that God means him good and not harm, believing that God is still sovereign, 
that God has not vacated the throne, believing that everything does work out eventually, ultimately, for good. The napkin could have contained a different tone of words, right? It could have been bitter. It could have easily been full of hate. It could have been written by a man overwhelmed by his grief. Instead, the pen carried words of faith, words of hope. What made the difference in his life? Well, he tells us, doesn't he? Faith is a choice, and he had made the choice to have faith. He had made the decision to have faith. I believe that promised land people make this choice. I think the people in the book of Joshua did. The reason we're studying the book of Joshua is because these people for seven years enjoyed seven years of unbridled victory. And right at the heart of their life is this drumbeat of faith that God keeps his promises. Promised land people believe in the promises of God. And when forced by life to stand at the intersection of disbelief and belief, they choose belief. They walk the path of faith, seldom with a skip, often with a limp, but still they walk in the direction of God. They press into his promises. This was the example of Joshua, and in many ways, a person could say this is the message of Joshua. The central message of the book is this headline, God keeps his promises. Trust them. Toward the end of the book, the author gives us this summary statement. So the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give their fathers. They took possession of it, and they dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. So the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand, and not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. These three verses are like the theological heartbeat of the book of Joshua. The narrator takes on the form of a commentator, as if to say, before you finish the book, I want to give you what all this book is about. Don't miss it. Don't read too quickly. God keeps his word. And concerned that we would miss it, the writer pounds his point home in triplicate. Three times in three verses, he says, God did what he said he would do. In verse 43, the Lord gave what he had sworn to give. Verse 44, the Lord gave rest according to all he had sworn to their fathers. Verse 45, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken all came to pass. God kept every single promise. One commentator was so touched by that last sentence that he named his commentary on the book of Joshua, no falling words. We live in a world of falling words. People speak words and they just fall to the ground. They make promises and they don't keep them. Maybe the promise was too big to make in the first place. Or maybe the character wasn't strong enough to uphold the promise. But you've heard your share of falling words. Oh, we'll take care of you till death do us part. I'll always love you. And then the words tumble. They are autumn leaves in November's wind. Falling words. You've heard your share, but you will never hear one from God. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. He is a covenant keeping, a covenant making God. And his promises are sure. And in a world where people break their promises and do not keep their word, you can trust God to do both. If he has spoken, you can be sure that that word will 
reign forever in eternity. The psalmist said the Lord's promise is sure. He speaks no careless words. All he says is purest truth, like silver seven times refined. In other words, all the dross, all the unnecessary ingredients are taken away. God is a covenant-keeping God. And for proof, the writer of Joshua says, just look to history. Look how God kept his promise to Abraham. God had promised Abraham that he would give Israel all the land that he had sworn to give their fathers. It's found in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. What you need to note, this is a promise that was made 600 years earlier. 600 years. God never forgot his promise. That's a long time. When Abraham died, he owned only a small parcel of Israel, just enough to bury his wife and family. And then the children of Abraham eventually ended up in Egypt, where they were slaves and sharecroppers. Moses got them out of Egypt, but he never got them into the promised land. How many times do you think those grisly, bearded sons of Abraham looked up to God and said, are you going to keep that promise? Do you remember your promise? And the book of Joshua says, yes, God keeps his promises. God did bless the children of Abraham. The promise he made was this, I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That promise has come true, Part, partly in Joshua, but entirely in our Joshua, Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, all the families and all the nations of the earth are blessed. Every person on the planet has equal access to hope, to redemption, and to forgiveness. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Our God is a promise-keeping God, isn't he? Others may make a promise and forget it, but if God makes a promise, he keeps it. He who promised is faithful. This matters if you are in the emergency room. This matters if you're feeling the sting of a divorce. This matters if you keep having more month at the end of your money than vice versa. You need to know God has not forgotten you. And he has made promises to you. And you are at that crossroad yourself. And you have to choose fear or faith. Do I look at my problems or do I heed God's promises? We all find ourselves at those intersections. Some of you are there today in a very dramatic fashion. And I believe that God has brought you here to say, I've made you some promises. You need to trust those promises. You need to remember the words of the great hymn, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. Nothing deserves your attention more than God's covenants. No words ever written on paper will sustain, strengthen, and nourish you like the promises of God. And so I'm wondering, do you know them? God keeps his promises. Know them. Our first point is God keeps his promises. Trust them. But our second one is know them. God says to the bereaved, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. That's a promise. To those who are besieged by problems, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. That's a promise. To the sick, the Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from the bed of illness. That's a promise. To the lonely, God says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. That's a promise. 
to the dying. In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. That's a promise to the sinner. My grace is sufficient for you. That's a promise. And these promises are for your good and mine. Peter the apostle said, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. God gives promises for your good and mine. Press into the promises. Memorize them. Put them on your bathroom mirror. Record them on a tape or in your iPhone and play it over and over. Major in the promises. And whenever troubles arise, you check those troubles against the promises of God. Trouble comes up, then you think, oh, wait, but God said. Trouble surfaces, you say, oh, but, but God said. But God said. And God's word, God's promises become the authoritative voice in your world, constantly trumping and silencing these voices of fear. This is the behavior of a promised land person. You have these promises, put them to use. Declare these words, I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. Turn again and again to God's spoken covenants. Do with God's promises what I did with the promise of the airline pilot. Not long after I met the fellow on the airplane, I was on another plane. I know I must be traveling too much. When that plane, I didn't meet somebody with a note on a napkin, but we sure ran into a storm. Consequently, the flight landed in Houston at the very hour my flight was supposed to be leaving for San Antonio, and it was the last flight of the night. As we taxied on the runway, I began to complain in my mind, that, oh, no, I'm going to be stuck in Houston tonight. I began thinking, where am I going to get a hotel room? I started to pull out my cell phone and called Dean Lynn. When all of a sudden, over the loudspeaker, the pilot came and gave us a promise. I know many of you are making connections. Just relax. We're holding all the flights. You'll make it home. At that moment, I thought to myself, well, I can do one of two things. I can either be anxious or I can trust the pilot. Now, I'm not too bright, but I thought, I'm going to trust the pilot. <laughs> so I didn't look for hotels. I put my phone away. I got off the plane in a leisurely pace, and I walked to the gate. I enjoyed the walk because I was walking empowered by a promise from the pilot. Apparently, not everyone in the airport had received a promise from the pilot. <laughs> Some of them were white-faced. They were running. They were jumping over each other. Or maybe they had received a promise and they had chose not to believe it. I made the flight. Your pilot has made you some promises. He has. Amen. <laughs> Are you right now empowered by the promises of your pilot? Or are you right now hearing the voices of your fear? You cannot choose whether or not your life will have problems. We didn't get a vote on that, right? But we do choose whether or not, in the midst of problems, we will listen to the voice of our pilot. My friend Wes Bishop did this. I wish you could have met Wes Bishop. In all my life, I don't know if I've known a finer man for 35 years, he lived in the same house 
worked at the same hospital, was a pillar in the same little Sweetwater, Texas community, married to the same wife, raised three wonderful sons, one of whom happened to marry my oldest daughter. He was a special man. A few months ago, Wes was diagnosed with brain cancer. We prayed for his healing, and for a time it appeared God had removed the cancer, but then it returned with a vengeance. And within a matter of weeks, Wes was in hospice care at home. He hadn't spoken in days, but still, the family placed a baby monitor next to his bed in case he were to cry out. The sons took turns keeping vigil, staying up at night in case Wes needed anything. One night, he did cry out. The youngest son heard his father's voice come through the speaker of the baby monitor. But Wes was not crying out for family. He cried out to Jesus. And he said this, Jesus, I want to thank you for my life. You've been good to me. And I just want you to know that when it's my time, I'm ready to go. Those were the last words anyone ever heard Wes speak. Jesus took him home soon thereafter. I want that kind of faith, don't you? The kind of faith that even on a deathbed says, I'm going to choose faith and not fear. I think that's a promised land faith. The kind of faith that takes an ink pen and presses into an airline napkin words of hope and says, faith is a choice, and I choose faith. May you do the same. Amen. This is our prayer, Father, that we would be people of faith. We confess to you, Father, it's not easy, but you already know that because you are, after all, our Father. You've gathered together people here to hear your story of keeping promises. And Heavenly Father, would you please let the message now go deep into our hearts and not just be a message we hear in this room, but be a message that really changes the way we live our week. That we will become more inclined to hear your promises and that we will not let our lives be lost in problems. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.